if your copy doesn't answer the question, what's in it for me, for your reader, immediately, then they're going to switch off. My name is Peter Sumpton, and you're listening to the Marketing Study Lab podcast. The podcast that gives you actionable marketing knowledge, getting you and your marketing in the best possible shape to be the driving force of your business for long-term success. From strategy and tactics to practical application, we've got it all covered. If you'd like to support the show, it'd be fantastic if you could leave a five-star Apple podcast review or get in touch, especially if you have a burning marketing question. I'd love to chat it through with you. Email me, peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. There's a link in the show notes if you can't be bothered searching on LinkedIn. So what are we going to learn and who's on Marketing Study Lab today? What can we learn from writing a book? Let me rephrase that. What actionable steps can we take from an Amazon best-selling ghostwriter and non-fiction book coach? Turns out, there's a lot of actionable steps to help us with our writing there. Helen Pollock has transitioned from writing lively and engaging copy for businesses in a whole host of sectors to helping business people to write better books and content through her business, The Content Doc. Helen believes that everyone can become a better writer and that creating a simple framework for content creation is the key to great business writing. But first, everyone needs this type of intro for their podcast in their lives. Helen, what is Marketing Study Lab in Mandarin? Right. Okay, I think it is. Ying Xiao Yan Jiu Xi Yan Shi. Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I love that. That was that was almost I kind of expected you to follow that up with marketing study lab. And then I have to repeat it and as if I was learning Mandarin. That's brilliant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Cool. So let's get into more serious stuff then. Now I'm going to okay. use that for my um uh audience abroad <laughs> get that sorted yes, podcast yes. in the in the far east fantastic um, international and, expansion here yeah, we come absolutely all down to your good interpretation um you'll be coming along with me for that but what's <laughs> and, and and this links to your background but what's the story that brings you to this point in your career and can you explain what you're up to now Sure, yeah. So um, my background is in marketing and PR, um, and I particularly went into PR because I love writing. Um, but I have worked in every area of the marketing mix and been a you know generalist marketing head of marketing and PR and all that kind of stuff. But um, when I had my uh, daughter, I didn't want to go back to my full time job, and for a long time, like literally since the early noughties, um, friends had heard me talk about a, having a portfolio lifestyle, <laughs> which um, is a, a really naff term. But <laughs> what it basically meant is, you know, I wanted to do a kind of maybe a bit of this and a bit of that and work flexibly. And when I had my daughter, this was all brought into really sharp focus. So um, I did a bit of after school, primary school um, club French teaching. Okay. Um, because my degree was French and Italian. And at that time, I kept hearing on the news that there weren't enough Mandarin speakers in the UK and the UK economy was losing out as a result. So I looked into it and there weren't many people, certainly not outside of London, offering primary Mandarin mm -hmm. in a fun and uh, lively way that was relevant for um you know for British children and the time to learn a, a language is in primary school okay time to start is then because for, for neurological reasons so we have a neural pathway in our brain because we're learning our mother tongue that's open until between the ages of 10 and 12 mm -hmm. and if we start learning a second language before you know before the age of 10 or 12 that will stay open for the rest of our lives wow, and make cool. le 
yeah, absolutely. Make learning a foreign language much easier. And I'm someone who benefited from that myself because we lived in the Middle East when I was a child. So I started learning Arabic at seven and French at eight. <laughs> Um, so I'm like, you know, living proof of this stuff. So anyway, so I, I started this um, primary Mandarin teaching business called Little Dragons. And alongside that, I was um, working in a part time PR job as well. Uh, but fundamentally, there wasn't enough meat in the sandwich. OK. So um, I was acting effectively as a kind of you know, middleman between a Mandarin teacher and um, a school or parent mm -hmm. and there aren't very many good Mandarin teachers and they charge loads but parents and schools aren't really willing to pay much more than they would for a French or Spanish teacher of whom there are far more mm -hmm. um, so yeah so after I did it for like five years and my word I tweaked that business model every which way but it just wasn't going to work for me. So I started, um, and it was such a relief. Oh, it felt so good when I started my own marketing and PR consultancy in Stad uh, at the end of 2018. And okay. then, oh, was it 2017? Anyway, a couple of years ago. And um, one of my lovely PR clients asked me if I would be interested in ghostwriting a book for him. He was already a best-selling author, but um, he didn't have time to write this second book. And this was actually from a podcast. So I worked on a series about a particular theme okay. on the podcast. And I then used um, that research material and the interviews in it to create a book. Mm -hmm. And that book became an Amazon bestseller. Um cool. And so now I've, I've, you know, I've ghostwritten some other books and I'm a, also a non-fiction and business book uh, coach. So oh, cool. either I can write people's books for them if they're not, if they don't have time or they're not confident about their writing, or I can coach them and give them a bit of support and accountability to write the book themselves and, and actually get it done. Because mm -hmm. it's one of those things that, tends to slip off the old uh, the bottom of the old to-do list it's always on the bottom of the old to-do list isn't it yeah <laughs> until you start doing it like anything I suppose exactly and it's a lot of the work I do is about helping people to frame their ideas and come up with a structure because once you come up with your table of contents I call that your book skeleton okay and then it's a matter of fleshing out the bones and once you've done that it's it's so much less overwhelming um so it's you know book coaching is about taking that mountain that people think is ahead of them in writing their business and or, or non-fiction book and breaking it down into mm -hmm. manageable chunks and giving them a clear path through it and you know giving yeah giving them some support along the way so, so basically as well as being a book coach and a ghostwriter, you support people to climb that mountain that they've always wanted to climb. Yeah, do you know, there's something um, really rewarding about helping people to realise a dream. Mm -hmm. And I also, I tend to specialise, um, not exclusively, but um, I help mm -hmm. a lot of women entrepreneurs um, to write their books. And that's particularly um, rewarding for me. Uh, but women are underrepresented in business books. Mm -hmm. um, and there are so many amazing women with really inspiring stories to share that, that make a positive difference to the world. You know, So to help people to tell those stories and inspire other people and particularly other you know, young women, that really means a lot to me. That's cool. I like that. Uh, it, it, it's weird that you say that um, about in, inspiring women. I, I remember when I started the podcast a few years ago and I was just trying to look for it th th then and it was episode 14 when I had the first lady come onto the podcast and I, I remember looking at it and it was just by coincidence. It, it was just episode 14 by no hook or by crook or anything. Um, and then I was just thinking, oh, imagine if I only had two or three like women representing the, the greatness that is the, the business world come on the podcast and 
I hope I get a nice little split between 50-50 and I, I think I do. Um, yeah. And I just remember that time looking back and thinking, I've had like 12, 13 people on, and they're all male. How has this happened? How <laughs> embarrassing. Um, but by episode yeah. 86, I interviewed uh, a lady called Laurie Wright, who she's an, a, 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 an author of children's books, which, which is quite cool. So that was dead interesting to, to learn about writing for children and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But I think today it'll be really cool because what I'd like to get from you and the actionable tips that I'd like you to bring to the podcast is kind of the issues that if I was going to write my own copy or someone else is going to write their own copy, what are the issues they need to know about and how do they make their their copy really pop yeah oh it'd be such a such a pleasure <laughs> cool go for it <laughs> <laughs> so I you know I've had to re- I have to review a lot of copy and have done um throughout throughout my career really throughout your and life. oh yes <laughs> and it's amazing how often I see the same issues cropping up and uh, so top of the list is it's not about you. Oh, what? I uh, know. Um, so all too often I see people um, writing as if they're writing for themselves, uh, you know, as in as if they are going to be the reader of it, <laughs> um, as opposed to thinking about um, who their audience is. And, you know, go back. Before we start writing anything, we really need to have like you know our kind of reader avatar sorted okay um if you're writing for business that's probably your customer avatar um we need to think about their pain points and those can then become the themes about which we write okay um so yeah just it's it's not about you it's about them um <laughs> and the and pain points not, weirdly yeah. enough it's about the pain points that they have that you solve which is like yeah. again you're not going to write it for you it's writing about their pain points exactly and yeah we see I, I, yeah, crikey we see this all the time generally in marketing i think where people go go on about like product or service features um rather than like benefits and outcomes i mean Mm -hmm. you know as someone who's reading something and particularly we need to remember that um if people are assailed by competing content their every waking moment (laughs) these days and so you know if your copy doesn't answer the question what's in it for me for your reader immediately then they're going to switch off Mm. So that's a re- that's my first and most important point, I think. Cool. And then the second thing is um, too many words. Right. Why use? Some people seem to think why use um, you know ten words if I can use twenty. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we just need to go through our copy, and we want every single word to add value. Every word, every sentence, if it doesn't give value to your reader, take it out. Okay. So if, I'm, if I've written something and it, it's really long, but I'm looking at it, I think, well, everything's valuable, but mm. I know it's too wordy. How the hell do I go about cutting words out? Is it a case of just being brutal or brutally honest? Um... So, you know, I am a professional writer and, and yet... Um, <laughs> I always can cull things out of my own writing when I go back to edit it. Um, Really easy places to start are um, words that don't mean anything. Actually, basically, just those kind of things. You you just like narrowed down my vocabulary to literally four words. (laughs) (laughs) I'm screwed. (laughs) basically you're just screwed yeah 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 yeah, yeah basically <laughs> so um, so things like that we, we put so many filler words in without mm. even realizing and just take those out for starters um also uh i like to try well we all need to find a balance between shorter sentences and longer sentences to add variety okay and make the piece more engaging it's yeah it's just you know variety is the spice and 
<laughs> we want to um, make this as engaging for the reader as possible. Um, so two wordy was at point number two. Yeah. And then the third one is use of jargon or corporate speak. Okay. Um, again, this is really closely linked to point number one. Um, there is a caveat. So if you are like a brain surgeon and you're writing for other brain surgeons, totally fine. Absolutely go for it. it so it does depend on your audience. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, never assume um, that your reader will necessarily understand things like acronyms um, that may be specific to your um, organization or sector. Yeah. I mean, there, there are ways that say so my other half is like a civil servant and there's there's turns of phrase that he uses that are pure civil service. You would never see them outside. Okay. Um, and it's really interesting. But uh, and most organizations are the same. Mm -hmm. So we what we don't want to do is we don't want language to become exclusive. And by that, I, I mean that in the pure sense of excluding people. We want all the people for whom this piece is relevant to be able to understand it. Um, so if we move on then to the kind of hints and tips for tackling these sorts of problems yeah yeah please so just just before you, you go on to that a uh, little little bonus pro tip for, for anyone if you do start in a, a new organization or, or more to the point a new industry then what i found was massively beneficial get your workbook first page start writing down all the acronyms and yes. don't be afraid if you're in a meeting or whatever and someone says oh yeah abc and you're sat there and you're like, is this, is this something I should know? What the hell's it? Just ask. Just ask. Don't, don't, don't be the dickhead that doesn't ask. Just yeah. ask what it means, write it down. And then the next person, when you say that and someone new's in the room, you can be the person, the bigger person that says ABC. And then you explain it to that new person rather than them sitting there like an idiot. Absolutely. And that's it. We, I think we just forget, don't we? We forget. Yeah that we have our own little, you know, vocabulary. Yeah, right, writing for your audience. Yeah. There you go. Sorry, I, I digress. So if, in terms of um, some really kind of quick win stuff mm -hmm. um, for better editing and proofreading of your own work, um, I, I'm quite into Grammarly at the moment. Oh, Grammarly's cool, yeah. I quite like Grammarly. I hate okay. to say it. Although it is a bit, I mean, it's, it's American English. So, you know, warning. <laughs> be careful, yeah. Be careful. Um, some people aren't keen on Grammarly. Well, Hemingway is a, another one that you can use that's similar that, you know, will act, actually suggest where you're going wrong with your writing. Um, the other thing is I'm very fond of the Flesh Kincaid uh, readability scale. I've never heard of that. What the heck is that? Have you not? Oh, total win then. Um, <laughs> if you go into your settings in Microsoft Word, um, yeah. if you go into the spelling and grammar settings, there's a little check uh, box, tick box, where you can add, it says, um, give readability stats. Just okay. tick that box. And then when you go through your kind of spelling and grammar check, it will tell you, it will give you a number um, out of 100. So 100 is like really easy to read. Um, and I think probably like, you know, 60, 70 is probably where you want to be aiming. 70s a pass. Uh, 70s like, sorry, 70s is a distinction. So um, I'm happy with 70, yeah. So, um, so that's, that's, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. So at a minimum of, um, yeah, 60 to 70, I'd say. That's cool. And then um, also within SEO, the SEO plugin Yoast, that also gives ah. readability statistics. Um, and certainly when I, you know, when I was learning, well, learning how to write things like press releases, um, for national newspapers when I was in PR we were taught to aim for um, a style that uh, an 11 to 13 year old child 
could understand. Okay. So again, that you know that it will depend on your audience. Um, I'm down with that. I'm down with yeah, eleven year old speak. That's good. <laughs> and I think it is. You know, it is it is just about um, not excluding people mm-hmm. uh, and making yeah. sure that everyone in your audience uh, can understand. Um, and they say the next one is um, get yourself a proofreading buddy. Okay, just explain that. So in PR agencies, um, we'll always have someone who checks your work after you've written a you know, feature, press release, whatever it might be, case study. One of your colleagues will check your work for spelling and grammar errors and you will check theirs. Um, and it's because an objective eye is priceless. And very often when we're writing, we become word blind. Mm. So having that person, someone else read it just makes a, a world of difference. So if you, you know, even if you work from home or whatever, is there a friend or business colleague that you can email something to and vice versa? um that's a really useful thing i i I find i'm pretty word blind right from the start (laughs) like so (laughs) yeah uh so so like having somebody that can prove for me is is essential for 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 me because it's just not a skill that that i've i've developed over time i've got better but i i make some terrible spelling mistakes and i'll i'll not happily admit it but openly admit that so proofreading buddy is, is like top of my agenda yeah, absolutely. And then, well, sort of moving on nicely from there, um, my other half is um, dyslexic okay. um, and has always um, you know, struggled with you know, spelling and grammar and, and just writing in general, mm. uh, really. So being able to have, oh, sorry about that, um, to have microsoft office read things aloud to him so read his own emails back to him before he sends them or read documents he's been working on back to him has been an absolute game changer and this i think there's something similar in like google docs as well okay but yeah if he picks up errors when um when documents are read aloud to him that he would never pick up through the normal spelling and grammar checks and just reading it back and That's he's become, do, well, do you know what? The, the best thing is, um, sort of with, my, with my support, uh, he, he's become a much better writer. That's cool. Over the last few years when he's, he's needed to do a lot more writing of like, you know, important documents. So people can improve. Don't ever think um, because it's not, it doesn't come naturally to me that mm. I can't improve because I've seen it with my own eyes. Okay. That's good to know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's really good to know. Uh, so reading aloud, I thought you were going to say read it aloud to yourself, which I suppose works as, as well, but I, I don't think I utilize that element of Microsoft Word enough uh, because yeah. I, I can see it being crucial, especially like I'm more of an audio or a visual person. That makes perfect yes. sense, but I don't use it. It's like, it, you know, old habits, break them yeah absolutely it's it doesn't take very long and you know it's just a a quick additional check uh, and it can make all the difference particularly if it's an important document because we all know that um the average spelling and grammar checker it doesn't understand context Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's the um... words that are correct but not in that place (laughs) Yeah, uh, yeah, com- completely agree. There's um, p- people use sentiment analysis, particularly for social media. And when I'm teaching, I always show an example. So there's there's a few sites where you can go in and test it. So you type in whatever you want and, and test the sentiment that it gives you. And I always make up some random comment, which is a bit flippant, along the lines of, this food is delicious. It even came with a free fly. <laughs> and because it is all positive in what you are saying, word wise, usually the sentiment analysis is positive by about 80 or 90 percent. 
<laughs> you take you take the free fly thing and it either goes down or stays at that percentage. And it's, you know, it's interesting. And I'm sure there'll become a time where this sentiment analysis can pick up on those um, those areas of dialect that might be sarcasm or it might be yes. something in terms of the, 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 the local slang or whatever it might be. But until such time, you've got to be so careful with things like that, particularly when you're yeah. analysing what people are, 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 are writing and how they're going to read it. Absolutely. And, you know, technology is fantastic, but it is definitely not infallible. Yeah, yeah, so, Comple- um, completely agree. So they are mega six amazing tips, which, <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely uh, learning from them and I've got to implement all of them in some way, shape or form, <laughs> without a doubt. Thank you so much for, for doing that. Uh, but this is going to be a bit more testy for you. So are you ready for some quick fire questions? I'm ready. Boom. Let's do it. What's that source of info you can't live without? Oh, it's got to be, it's got to be blinking Wikipedia. (laughs) I think, because I'm really nosy and I just, I like to find out about stuff and it's just such a great resource. It is. I think if if it were taken away from me, I'd be be bereft. (laughs) It'd be interesting to see what the top search would be for random queries if Wikipedia yeah. didn't exist. And give all the smaller yeah. websites a chance. Come on. Yeah. You know, give, them, give us a break. It's like you can't get I away from like, I like Quora as well, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it's Wikipedia is where it's at. But I, I find that I'll trust Wikipedia until it's crucial I get something right. And then I'll read it and I'll be like, but is that right? <laughs> yeah and nine times out of ten it is if not a hun- 99 out of 100 um it's usually bang on so yeah interesting one here what was the last thing you remember searching on google mm, so i'm totally busted here aren't i so i googled what is marketing study lab in mandarin <laughs> Okay, that's fair enough. But having said that, even if you did, even if you have been busted, um, you still have to had to pronounce it. So that is fair play, and you did a cracking job with that. So we'll let you off in terms of the search. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so if you could tell your ten year old self one thing, what would it be? Do you know what? Um, and my ten year old self would be really surprised about this. Money is important. <laughs> <laughs> And that sounds like a really daft thing to say, but um, I was kind of brought up to see money as a bit of a sort of dirty word, mm. and and also um, that like other things were more important. Um, you know how how you are as a person, and and all sorts of things like that. And I I completely agree with that. Yeah, those values are right. However, I need to tell my son and daughter that they that what money is is options. Yes, completely agree. Money is choice. Yeah. And you, what you want to do is make sure um that whatever you do gives you enough money to have choice and options in life and mm-hmm. never feel trapped. Um, so that, yeah, that's what I would say, which, Uh, yeah. I like that. It's it's quite, in a backwards way, it's really refreshing because you always hear that that, that money isn't the end of the world and it isn't. And that, you know, you should always do what you love rather than doing it for the money. And you should, but in the same respect. And, and, and if you want to live on a very, very small amount and live that lifestyle, that is absolutely 100% well done you, you know, fantastic, great job. But you still unfortunately need it. And the way you phrased it there in terms of having options is absolutely perfect. It's not about the money in your account. It's the options it provides to do good or support or invest or whatever it might be. It's options. Absolutely love it. Um, No, that's right. You know, I, I just feel like you can just be it sounds like ridiculous but kind of be the best version of yourself mm. if you've got some funds behind you you know do that charity thing that you've always wanted to do or um you know if you're 
pa elderly parent um, needs a hip replacement and that the, you know they're in agonizing pain and it's mm -hmm. going to be 18 months on the NHS be able to pay for private medical care mm -hmm. it's yeah yeah you know there's a whole different argument about whether that's right or not but it's it, it can solve some of life's problems and and allow you to take up some of life's opportunities as well yeah com completely completely agree talking of life's opportunities two final questions here the first one is is like a, a, a biggie, so so brace yourself. Um, okay. Chinese, Indian, or chippy tea? Profound. <laughs> Tricky. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's it's one of these decisions that is a head scratcher. I'm gonna go for I'm gonna go for Chinese. Oh, okay. My parents lived in Singapore for seven years yeah. and um it's eighty one percent ethnically Chinese man I've had some great food <laughs> I can imagine yeah absolutely yeah and such variety as well I was because say, China's a massive com country yeah and you're kind of limited for chippy tea aren't you I'm not I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not dismiss, d dismissing the idea I'm just saying kind of limited <laughs> yeah no I, I agree I, I'm a proud Yorkshire woman do not get me wrong um Brian's in Headingley in Leeds Okay. Brought up on their fish and chips, amazing. Obviously, have to be fried in dripping. <laughs> Terrible fish and chips available in Leamington Spa in general. Okay. There's only one place that fries in dripping, and that's amazing. But yeah, but yeah, but that's a bit. It's a bit mono, isn't it? Fish and chips. Yeah, yeah. Good, but yeah, I don't think it'd be my go-to. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but final crucial question: If people need your assistance, they want to find you, or want to know more about what you can offer where should they go they should go to that well-known german social media site linkedin <laughs> as my friend's mum called it <laughs> proudly to her uh, <laughs> and i've never been able to think of it differently since <laughs> that's brilliant um yes linkedin you will find me there and um i regularly uh, but generally about once a week i'll put a, a, a helpful video on there um mm -hmm. and also I, you know regularly put um links to um little mini courses or pdf checklists or general helpful and useful content Good. um my website is www.thecontentdoc.com um, and again, there's um, some you know, good blog posts on there and, and, and resources. So, so yes, and I'd be delighted to, uh, to help people out to you know, help them write better, whether it's a blog or a book. Excellent. So I'd, I'd really love to, to finish this episode by saying, um, Helen, thank you so much for joining us in Mandarin. But I, I well, even if I knew how to say it, I wouldn't be able to say it. So I'm not even <laughs> going to. So I'll probably just say thank you so much for joining us on the marketing. So that has been an absolute pleasure and um, bonjour. Oh, well, I can say xie xie, that's thank you, and zai jin, and that's uh, goodbye. So yes, it is. So yes, thank you so much for having me. Helen, once again, thank you so, so much for joining us on the Marketing Study Lab podcast and sharing all those actionable tips for writing. I know my writing is going to be better after listening to some of those elements. But what I want to highlight now, as I always do, is just some takeaways from that chat with Helen. And the first one is that you should never write for you. Always write for your customer. Consider their pain points because they're probably different to yours and this should be the focus on what you're writing. And if you're unsure, ask, find out, speak to your customers. What do they want to know about? Keep it simple. Just like no one wants to be sold to, no one wants to try and decipher what the heck you're going on about. Cut the jargon and write in an easy to understand way, but don't be afraid to add variety to your sentences. This will help keep your audience engaged throughout your copy. And finally, read it aloud. There is no better way to find out how your copy actually sounds to someone 
than reading it back or even getting someone else to read it to you. This is why TV, films and yeah, kind of scripted podcasts always have read-throughs, fine-tuning for their audience. So you should be doing the same. And action. Thank you so much for joining us today on Marketing Study Lab. It really means the world that you're listening to this out there. And hopefully I've provided you some value. If you're looking to know more about what Marketing Study Lab does and is about, go to marketingstudylab.co.uk or get in touch with me personally, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or feel free to email me at peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. Happy marketing. Oh.